thanks all for coming. It's great. It's great to have this forum. I, um, I was with a group last night uh, in another part of Massachusetts, and there were like 25, but it was a, a 15-minute presentation. So, mm -hmm. is ours 20 minutes? What do we got? Um, I got a flight at 6 a.m., so that's my window. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> we'll leave before 6 in the morning. Okay. You're, in, you're in charge of the clock. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. So just raise your hand or start talking if you have questions or comments or disagreements or hallelujahs or whatever. Um, so some of you have seen my TED Talks. So I'm going to try to, some of this changes over time and some of it doesn't. There are some core principles um, that for us are really important. And, um, and so I, I tend to Try and focus on those principles. If you start with the principles, the challenge is, is that most people think this is a how do we get fast internet problem? Because that's what we all experience, right? How do we, they define the problem as fast internet and usually at a lower price. But all of the incumbents can do fast internet if they want to. Mm -hmm. so, so if you define it that way, you have to be prepared for them to solve that problem and then whatever falls out of that. We don't define the problem that way. We think the problem, that that's an effect of uh, the, what we define as the root problem. Um, and I, so I'm gonna kind of focus on what we think is the root problem. I think it'll be consistent with a lot of what you're thinking. Um, Kevin Kelly, I, I quote a few people a lot. Kevin Kelly's one of them. He has, Familiar with him? Started Wired Magazine. So he wrote this book, New Rules for a New Economy, I think in 98. So you know, 20 years old. In technology years, you know, that's like 80 years, right? <laughs> but 80% of this book is still relevant, maybe 90. And so it's, it's an e-book. You can go to his website and pull it down. Um, the key ideas in there are really that communication is the economy going forward, communications economy. If you don't understand how networks work, you're gonna have a hard time understanding how the economy works. And that's kind of a technology comment, but it's also just, the, the world is networked for the way commerce happens, and the way relationships get built, and, and a lot, the way a lot of other important things in life happen. So he's, for him I think, communications and computers are the sectors that are driving all the other sectors. They are the things that are changing everything. And so you can't just say it's another thing. It's actually the thing that's affecting all the other things. And so the importance of them is <coughs> paramount. Okay. Um, so the problem. Uh, Today, the reality is that network op the network operators and the service providers are the same folks. Same companies are both. And so, you know, the question, who should network serve? When they have the amount of control they've got, you know, it's just too tempting to not serve your own interests, right? If you've got total control, you're, you're going to serve your own interests. And their interests, we don't believe, are aligned with the interests of cities, towns, individuals. They're good companies, and I'm not here to dismantle these companies, but the model that they have organized and perpetuated is really problematic. And you're all here because of the effects of that problem. So we're interested in changing the model not trying to disparage these companies or, you know, they provide a lot of them, they employ a lot of people and I think they're good companies in many ways. We just really don't like their model. And so that's where we're focused on. How do we change the model to make the model serve the people that actually fund the networks, which are the subscribers. They fund it, but they have no power in the equation. So the solution for us is a separation of power. We feel like networks should be controlled locally. In order to obtain the value that communities want from a network, control should be local. 
and and then we're interested in pushing all the service providers to the cloud, including the ISPs. And when I say the cloud, you know, that means they're software companies. That cloud could be in a municipal sort of computer room, so it's not necessarily Amazon's cloud. But they're software companies, they have a presence in a small data center or a medium or large data center, whatever, whatever works. But this separation is the key thing for us. Separating the infrastructure and services and local control of infrastructure. So if your mayor or any other mayor thinks that the, the problem can be solved by Comcast, that they're probably solving the fast internet problem. We're interested in solving local control of infrastructure. That's the problem we're trying to solve. And there's going to be a whole bunch of positive effects once you get local control of infrastructure. And one of them will be fast internet, one of them will be a drop in price, but then you'll be able to start using the network in important ways that won't happen with a large income. Okay? So that's the problem to us, is how do we get local control of infrastructure? Think about the, inner, we're, we're all used to this side of the internet. We're used to that side too, but we just don't think about it very much. So this side, where we access Google, Amazon, whatever we do, um, we would argue that has become what it is because it's an open system. If it wasn't open, then it never would have, it never would have become what it is. Um, and so, open at least, for, it, it can mean a lot of things, but for us it, at least it means it's open to innovation and it's open to competition. So, and then we can, we can add to that definition, but at least has those qualities. And people would argue, you know, there's a lot of concern now that those companies are getting too powerful and that the effect of that is to sort of close the internet, meaning um, we're not the customer, we're, we're we're being used by them to get what they want is a concern of a lot of people. Um, so that's a different topic. <laughs> this system over here, the way we access the internet, is a closed system. So these companies have all built their silos. The internet really came out of academia and military. And initially, my understanding of the history of it is that it was meant to be really an academic test bed. It was a way for research to happen and information to flow between researchers. And then the military had their interests in this kind of network. But as it became obvious that there was commercial viability, um, these folks all had infrastructure and they figured out that they could leverage that infrastructure. Are you familiar with the lawsuit out in Oregon, out in Multnomah County? So early on, there was a lawsuit. The county sued I think it was AT&T and one of the cable companies because they were closing it, the system and Multnomah County filed a lawsuit saying this has got to be an open system, edge to edge, open access, open to innovation competition. And the way it came down is there was some legal, legal language that allowed them to say, you know, it's different than phone service. And, and so they were able to do what they wanted with the system. When, so, when was that lawsuit? Um, if I give you an answer, I'll give you the wrong answer, but I'm going to say it was in the 90s. Okay. Um, it was in Multnomah County. So... A while back. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, I'm trying to remember where I... I listened to somebody talk about this lawsuit, so I'll try to find that and shoot it to you. So, um, we're interested... We think we don't even really know what will happen if we open up access. And we don't mean, by, by open it, we don't just mean open it to multiple ISPs. We mean open it up so that people can access the network to innovate. And that's kind of, that's not completely intuitive because we think about, we do that over here. And I'll get into that in more detail, but we think there's a lot of power that's latent in opening up access to the network. And, and I'll, I'll dive into that a little. So everybody, if you see my TED Talks, you've seen this slide. This is sort of our 
if somebody says I don't understand open access, then I would pull this slide up, um, which is we've really designed the system works like this now. The slide on the left, where you know FedEx, if they built a road and wouldn't let anybody go on it but them, and then UPS does the same thing. So we've got it in wireless and we've got it in wired space. So now we're talking about repeating this terrible model in 5G, and the reason it's coming up is that cities don't want microcells every 1,400 feet from four different carriers. We don't want cities decorated with microcells, which is, you know, sort of what the model's going to be. So, to us it makes a lot more sense for the city to own the infrastructure and for whatever people want to do wirelessly, do it as software companies. And that's going to lower the barriers to competition. That's going to lower price in the wireless space. But we'll focus on the wires tonight. So this is our model on how it should work. This is the way airports work. You've got infrastructure owned by communities. And then as long as people play by the rules, you can drive on that road. So that's really, that's easy to understand from an ISP. But it, it goes beyond the ISP. It goes to what else can we do with the network? So in terms of principles, this is a key principle for us. Um, whoever controls the infrastructure has control. So, you know, we don't think Comcast is going to solve the problems the city wants to solve. And the city may not articulate those problems very well. But the problems that the consumers have and the problems that um, cities increasingly are going to have to deal with technology issues as we get to drones and autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, et cetera, cities are increasingly, they've got more technology issues coming at them that many are not prepared to respond to. If the city controls the infrastructure, they're in a much better position to start making policy. Now, one of those things is the digital divide. And the digital divide is it's not just an access issue, it's affordability issue. And, you know, I think about, I stay in a lot of hotels and I think about the workers that are cleaning that hotel room. And I'm just imagining, you know, they've got kids going to school. How are they navigating a 100 to $200 internet bill or cell phone bill, you know, making what they're making you know, if they got children, how does, how does that come together? So the price, um, you know Ray Dalio, does that name mean anything to you? Yeah. So Ray Dalio runs Bridgewater, which is the largest private hedge fund in the world. And he just wrote a book called Principles, which is, he's about, he's retiring and turning Bridgewater over. Um, but this book, Principles, is everything, he, all the principles he's learned through life and work. And I would recommend, it's a great book. Um, but when he talks about the economy, he talks about two economies in the U.S. People say, how's the economy doing? Because he, he made a ton of money in 2008 when the economy crashed. He, he saw it coming and had bet heavily against it and made a ton of money. So people now say, you know, we've had this 10-year run, how's the economy doing? He says, which economy? Because there's two economies. There's an economy for the upper 40% and there's an economy for the bottom 60%. And the economy for the bottom 60% is terrible. It is really bad. The economy for the upper 40% is pretty good. That's his answer. So, you know, this, if you think this infrastructure is essential, then it's essential for everybody, for the bottom 60% and the top 40%. And so we got to, cities will really only solve that problem. But I don't believe at all that any of these incumbent companies are going to take that problem seriously. I have a question uh, yeah. about infrastructure. So, um, in an ideal world where we're going with the model of cities owning the infrastructure, um, obviously cities need to connect to other cities yep. and countries need to connect to other countries. And so, um, what's the thinking behind that? That the U.S. government would own anything that's connecting city to city and that governments would just cooperate and yeah. build country-to-country country kind of links or 
Yeah, so I think about it in terms of disruption theory. Mm -hmm. So disruption theory came out of the Harvard Business School and um, one of the key ideas in disruption theory is that it always happens from the bottom of the market. So for us, that was Ammon, Idaho. You know, this sort of town of 17,000. People will say, you know, how big are the cities you're working in? And we're saying, we say, we want those cities, we want to perfect this before we go to a city of even 200,000. We want to perfect everything we're doing, so we want it to happen at the bottom. So the, to answer your question, as one city solves this problem and the city next to them solves the problem, we're going to get kind of a natural path. The state's not going to figure this out. Cities are going to figure this out, and the state's going to react, and the county's going to react. Counties will, will solve it in certain really rural situations. Our belief is that cities are going to figure this out, and as they do, then the state's going to wake up and start to figure out how they should play mm -hmm. in all of this. I don't know that we need to get to the national stage, actually, if the states will figure it out. So right now, for cities that are moving towards municipal control, yeah. they're still purchasing a connection to the main infrastructure of the internet from some private company that, getting back. that has the Yeah, you the still have the same problem at the bigger level. Replicated at the middle mile. Yeah. So you're doing it in small places so you can get the kinks work out before you get to big places. So what are some of those kinks that we have to worry about? You know, the, um, it's a good question. You know, we want it to happen that way. That doesn't mean it's necessarily happening that way because we are now working with a smattering. So, I mean, Quincy, I would say, you know, it takes cities a year to really get going. And so Quincy, you know, I think, I think they are going to do something. But I think it'll take them a year to, to get going. In terms of the kinks, it's really a scale thing. We know it works at this size, but you want to gradually move up the stack because you don't really know what you don't know as you scale this kind of network. So I think that's the general answer is we know what it does at this size, but we don't know what it does at 100,000. We've built it to scale. But building it, in, building it in theory is different than operating it in reality. So I, I think that's the... So when we work with big entities, we're telling them, treat your first project like a neighborhood. And then once you get comfortable with that, go to a bigger area. And, and we've got to scale it within your macro size. But that's true in any city. I mean, cities have to learn how to operate it, and they have to learn how to... Splice and, and do the kind of stuff to run a network. Did I answer your question fully? Uh, I think so. Yeah. You know, that um, there is no real answer mm -hmm. to that question, but the cities will work it out amongst themselves and that will drive the bigger yeah. the bigger issue. I mean, I, I'm familiar with that concept. Um, the person who actually founded this organization is using the same concept. Uh, with a nonprofit to get money out of politics, mm -hmm. you know, doing an, a, a constitutional amendment that you know you have to get rid of corruption and you can't take money from, you know, large donors. Yeah, that's not going to happen because the people who would vote on that are the people who are getting the large donations. But yeah. if you go city by city, like a town like Northampton that would agree we're not going to allow contributions in our town, yeah. then all of a sudden the people who are getting elected to state office are following those local rules. Next thing you know, the state is on board, enough states yeah. are on board, it moves to this. Yeah. Same concept, different. Yeah. Yeah, so I live in Utah, and one of the interesting things that's happening there is UDOT, Department of Transportation, is very active in the fiber space. And they, they have a connected vehicle. It's not an autonomous vehicle, it's a connected vehicle. And so they're, you know, they've got a vision of running that um, down at Interstate 15, which is the main artery between Vegas and, and the top of Utah. And so they've, they've got a lot of fiber, and their mindset is they want to work with the cities. They want to provide backhaul. And they're not trying to displace private sector, but they want a flourishing because of the fiber. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our own philosophy is this should work like the roads. And we figured that out. 
but um, I think it'll naturally, cities are going to naturally peer with each other, as cities figure it out, depending on where they are in proximity. Um, but if you've got an open system here and an open system here, but a closed system in between, then you sort of got problems mm -hmm. there. Well, there are, you know, in this particular geographic region, there are quite a few cities who are either already on board with municipal networks or getting there quickly. Yeah. Um, so I could see in this in this area how that, that model of the cities working out amongst themselves could definitely happen. Yeah. South Hadley is talking about building it. Leverett has already built it. Westfield, you know, yeah. and a bunch of other towns. So yeah, I could see that working here. Do you yeah. know anything about the fiber that was laid? 15, 20 years ago, under I-90? Is this the Axie? Is this the one that had the big lawsuit? No, it's not Axie. It's not Axie, but there, there is some on 90 and 91 started with the, yeah. um, the one under 91 started to service the five college area. Yeah. And then it's oh, gone yeah, up. So and it forms the backbone, but yeah. it also is. Um, How long is it? I think it's yeah, mainly, no, I think it's, it's state. Well, it was put in privately, and then I went out, it was up for sale, and I don't know what happened. Yeah, Isn't that part of Open private. Cape, it was called? Like, no, I don't think no, it was No, no, it was... It's connecting the, the um, academic I'm institutions 90. and giving them back all to Boston, right. I believe. Right. Right. If, if it's owned by five colleges, it's actually a separate entity. Five colleges is just part of yeah. it, five colleges. Do you think they, they, they paid the money to build it all the way to Boston? No, mm -hmm. it's a ring. Yeah, the, this, this is not that. Oh, it's not the same thing. Are you thinking of the middle mile network? That, that yeah. MBI one two three. It didn't I mean I don't know. I had a <coughs> the I had a relative that sold fiber, and uh, so I know it was put in a long time ago, and then it was up for sale, and I was thinking when Google was looking for places to do a demo project, I thought, oh well, since we already had all this fiber, they. Could and I think maybe 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 Google bought that fiber, but anyway, we they had didn't. all that fiber. And I think it was owned by Sprint at the time when it yes. was laid, and I don't. Yeah. I think it might still be dark fiber. Yeah. Do you know who bought it? I actually do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> after when that fiber went up for sale, the five colleges bought it with someone else. I don't know who the someone else is, but I know the five colleges own at the least Stephen half of it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, was, the, there's, well, there's a fiber that runs from the five colleges to Boston, and then a different one that runs from the five colleges to New York. Right. And they own at least 50%, I believe, of both of them. Oh. Uh, the high, I work for the IT department at the high school, and we're tied into um, yeah. the five colleges. That's how we get our internet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and um, I don't know who the other <laughs> purchaser was, but I remember Yeah, no, I don't know who the other purchaser is either. a long time. <laughs> Um, and then that bandwidth from there, I believe, gets is bought from AT and T. Unfortunately, the back hall. Yeah, it's, once nice. it leaves the end of the fibers on ninety ninety one, I believe it's bought by from AT and T on both ends or something. I unfortunately, thought, I thought Penny, in I the New York end California it went to Lifetower. Tim, Blatt. it might. I don't know. I it did on, okay. on the New York Mass. side, I think it's Lifetower. Okay, I believe you. <laughs> That's my area. Oh, you masked us. Tim Blondin. Oh, yeah. Oh, let me text him. You should be able to tell you. Let me actually text him. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we're jumping ahead here, but yes, still. Let me get your TED talk. You talked about the services versus the infrastructure. I have questions about that, but I'll save it if that will, if you're going to get to that. No, that's your question. Because that's kind of where I was getting very confused. I understand. Mm. I'm trying to understand the model that you're proposing. So if, if here in Northampton, the city would just own own or provide the infrastructure to everybody, is there like a recommendation like one gigabit per second to every home or business um, in the city? Well, the, the city would not provide any services on that network. Um, Just municipal services. So, yeah. like Northampton Community TV, which is taping this particular. Yeah. And anybody, any service company, any provider out there would be welcome to uh, maybe they have to negotiate with the city to get on. on the I mean, if they're willing to, they're, the city's going to set policy and set rules on rules of engagement for being in the network, and as long as people, I mean, cities should encourage innovation on the network. So if you've got an idea and you want to bring it, people just think of ISP, but we want to see a lot more happening 
with the network. That, that was part of my confusion in your TED talk. You yeah. talk about you can just click here and change your service provider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are you actually changing there? If the infrastructure is provided by the city, you, are you basically saying that if I want Comcast as my service provider, they will and they're they're going to meter me for 100 megabits per second or something? Because that's the plan I signed up for. Yeah. Uh, but if for some reason. I would think the performance would be fine from from a Comcast provider because it's using the city's network. So why would they go to some other provider? Um, unless it's just a price issue. It could be price. It could be, you know, we think more and more they're going to get focused on what kind of value can I. So a lot of the problems people have are inside their home. I mean, just not understanding their network or what it's doing, and so. <clears throat> Once you take the infrastructure from the ISP, they are not doing a lot. They're going to give you an IP address. They're going to give you backhaul. Um, and they're going to give you some kind of customer support. Um, and so part of the idea is encourage them to think of new ways that they can add value. Some may be, you know, there's different ways that you can sort of protect family, children from bad content. Um, but a lot of people just have problems inside their house, either there's dead zones in the house or when the system goes down, they don't understand what's happened, but. So who would provide that service? Would the city provide it or would you call Comcast? So we're system? working on some tools where we're going to tell the customer where the network's down. We haven't launched them yet, we're working on them. So that means we're gonna say, this is a network issue, so it's a city problem. So if you're going to call somebody, call the city or, or whoever's operating the network. If it's the ISP, then it's an ISP problem. It's their network that's down to call them. So we're, we're going to, I mean, that's part of the innovation you can do if it's an open network, right? I mean, if there's a, way, if there's a platform for innovation, those are the kinds of problems you can start to solve. Um, so... Is your question, you may have asked a few questions in there. Yeah. Is, is one question, how does it how does it work on how you switch ISPs, or is your question, why would you want to do that? Well, I can understand various service providers, like a 911 service provider or something, mm -hmm. and they got a certain amount of bandwidth. I don't understand why if you can get if it's an ISP, Time Warner versus uh, Comcast, how they would differentiate themselves, or you're saying maybe you can get a static IP, from mm -hmm. one and DHCP from another one? I don't know. Support? Yeah. Programming, right? Television, what you provide over yeah. the, I mean, if you're not going to do yes. over the top, you get packages which have different values to different people, and that's a big distinguishing factor. So Netflix, for example. And would if Netflix the, be bundled and part of a Comcast provider, or would it be a separate thing that you would just purchase from Netflix directly so it no longer... I think you're, you're going to... I think a natural evolution will be that Netflix will will flow through a layer two or layer two and a half network. So I, I think eventually, and not in the too distant future, um, I've actually been talking to the guy at Netflix who um, decides who gets caching servers and, and what size, and he's given us guidelines on when that makes sense. So, uh, you know, I think at a simple level with the ISPs, the idea is to create competition, which affects price sure. most immediately. Um, but it will affect just the way they interact with their customers. I mean, if you have a monopoly, we know monopolies get worse over time. If you've got a monopoly, sort of your behavior deteriorates over time. If you've got competition, everybody behaves better uh, in terms of being responsive. But the low-hanging fruit is price. And so part of the frustration people have is they're just boxed in. I just got this one option. They can charge me whatever they want because I know I don't have another option. And, and so to us, the ISP, I refer to the ISP as the gateway drug to an open network, meaning that's what people understand. And so that's what they're going to emotionally react to initially. But... As you create an open network, what the ISP does gets paired back. Over time, they automate against each other. So much of what they do will be, become automated. Um, 
and then their real value is going to be price and how do they respond to customers to help them. Wouldn't ISP become a default term? You've got an internet network provider, which would be presumably the city, and suddenly all of service is the way it works. It's content, perhaps. Well, it's internet. Because, it, because internet if, the city, if the city is providing the infrastructure, that's not giving you internet. That's giving you connectivity. Somebody's still got to connect you to the internet. So they still are an internet provider. They're still connecting you, giving you access. So how, how, many, say, oh, how many different providers does Anon have? They have four. And are those all internet providers? Those are all ISPs. And a lot of the folks that will be interested in this are wireless ISPs. So they're, they, do have, they, are, they know how to be an ISP, but they don't have a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. What they've got is wireless. So there, for them, it's a new market, and they just come in, and they once they connect, then they can access. So does this make five G more possible? Um, so standards for five G aren't defined yet, so five G's mostly a marketing campaign at this point. But there is real technology behind it. It certainly makes it more possible for your community. You're going to make it a lot easier. Let's say if you wanted to engage T-Mobile and said, we got the fiber, come provide the service. Again, they're a software company, right, at that point. You're providing all the infrastructure. So whatever value 5G contains, I think of it as low latency, the ability to virtualize the network and higher speeds. We'll see where it, you know what the value ultimately ends up being. When you say wireless ISP, what are you, what are you talking about? So they're, they're called WISPs. Yeah. And um, so they, what they'll do is they'll serve their, rather than serving their customers with wires, mm -hmm. so Comcast serves with DOCSIS cable wires, the wireless ISPs serve their customers with a signal. They're mm -hmm. shooting this, so they're going to get in some high place, they're going to shoot a signal, to their customer, and they're going to serve this one and this one and this one over here. That's what Greenfield is doing. So that's what Greenfield is doing. So the five G, we're talking about that would there would be a special, there would be a different ISP. It's a different thing. That's so so five G, five G is mainly being done by Verizon, AT and T, T Mobile, and Sprint. Mm -hmm. T Mobile and Sprint maybe become the same thing, but um, you know if you think about what those companies do well. It's wireless. Mm -hmm. That's right. Comcast is pretty silent on 5G, as far as I'm. Are you hearing anything about Comcast and 5G? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they've won the wire, right? I mean, they've successfully, they've really killed those other companies in terms of market share for the wire. And so 5G, 5G is solving some wireless problems for them. They're they're having some challenges keeping up with the consumption. So they want faster speeds. They want to bring in new services. They also <coughs> want to they want to take back some of that to the home mm -hmm. business. So you're saying it's uh, because the five G still has to be connected to a fiber piece mm -hmm. running along the pole. That you're not considering that as part of the wireless. So you're talking about WiMAX two. Yeah. So what I say is wireless works best the faster it gets back to fiber. All wireless works best the faster it gets back. So what's coming out of a cell tower is fiber, what's coming out of 5G is fiber. And so people talk about 5G as if it's something different mm -hmm. than fiber, but it's very fiber intense. And, and there's different spectrum, which gives you different distances is the way I understand it. And But the spectrum that people are focused on is a range of 700 feet. So you're going to end up having microcells every 1,400 feet because it can shoot this way. Mm -hmm. So you're going to end up with a lot of cells. And if you're getting those cells from multiple companies, then you know that, that's multiplying. I guess I was trying to get at is uh, what about the, what about the WiMAX two, which is you know I mean most of this WiMAX is in Europe. It's not here, yes. or it's in South America. Yeah. Um, you, do you have any experience with that? So. The person that I trust the most, we, we've been interacting on some projects. I've got a good friend who's trying to get the internet to the four billion people that don't have it. 
and he's in San Francisco. And he's introduced me to some, some of the people that run in his circle. One of them is a physicist who works for a really big company, a big, well-known brand name company. And so I asked him that question two weeks ago. He came to Ammon to see our project. And I said, you know, what do you see as the path for 5G versus alternatives? He said that what he thinks is going to happen long term is it's going to be fiber into the premise and then wireless back out. So whatever we do, it's going to, we're going to go fiber to the prem and then wireless out. And I think he thinks that not from a technology point of view, but from a business model point of view. He think, He's very skeptical about the business model for, for 5G, that it's, it's not going to play out as <coughs> advertised. You know, I have a related question. We've been kind of debating among ourselves what 5G means. Am I correct that if, if you want to be a 5G provider, you got to go to the FCC and they have go, some uh, go to the au auction and pay for that spectrum? In this case, it's going to be only private companies, presumably, who are going to have authorization to use that particular spectrum, in which case it's not really part of a community net or a municipal network model. Yeah. So, to me, that's kind of like your uh, multiple lane highway, I'm sorry, single lane for each provider highway. Is that essentially what you get if you have a 5G infrastructure? The way it's being conceived today, yes. So, so he, he thinks that there's other technologies like CBRS, and he thinks CBRS may, which is unlicensed spectrum, that may end up being a business model that will work. So unlicensed spectrum. So, yeah. So. But that's being. That's like targeted TV. to utilities currently. Yeah, yeah. So I think this has all got to play out. We it's really early. I mean, there's so much marketing around 5G that everybody thinks, well, man, there's something happening out there that I'm not aware of. I mean, that's not happening in my life, but it must be happening in somebody else's life. I think this is all still a big science experiment. Well, we. The problem is our poli there's at least one politician on our city council we've been told who believes 5G will solve a problem, competition problem. A lot of people think that. And I don't think so. I think it just makes it more available, but doesn't need to reduce the prices. Yeah. yeah I think the product would be as good. Fiber to your home is going to be faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Plus, it, it solves the fiber to the home problem. You can't always be within 700 feet of a, of a, a cell. A cell. <coughs> I mean, your point about would 5G be um, private industry versus municipal yeah. because of the way they're auctioning the spectrum and everything? I mean, certainly that's a political question because there's nothing stopping a city from building a 5G municipal network. I think there is. I think the FCC says the, the spectrum. spectrum will be yeah. bought by the there's, there's a spectrum. You yeah. yeah. can't get spectrum. <coughs> Maybe the city can get the horizon. Well, say we'll can't get it if you're a municipality. Well, you know, you, or unless you have a billion dollars there, you know. That's right. yeah, that's, I mean, that's where it's going. Well, basically, you got money, you can buy it. Enough money, you can buy it. There's enough well, pressure on it, it's getting more expensive. It depends where mm -hmm. you are. I mean, yes. it's it depends where you are, and, and it also depends on, um, depends where you are, how, how much com competition there is. And I understand the rules are okay as long as you provide certain services. You can bid. Doesn't mean you have the money to bid, but you're eligible to bid on the spectrum in certain areas if you meet certain yeah. criteria, which some municipalities do. But this CBRS is that's the spectrum you were telling me about today that is open for, for utilities. That's what utilities so, over the last five years have been fighting to get that spectrum. So if the politicians still decide it. to open that spectrum up to municipalities. Uh, that will change things, right? We have, we have a senator, Senator Markey, who, uh, not, no shameless plug, but he, he's, um, you know, he prides himself on opening up the telecoms in the first place. Mm -hmm. So political, political action um, gets results. I mean, the well, Hilltowns are doing very well because they had nothing and they got up in arms and they organized and they, they get money. So if, it, if it's the FCC who's regulating 5G at least. Um, yeah, that's federal. Yeah, but I mean, theoretically, obviously this would be an incredibly hard uh, political battle, but theoretically the FCC could change gears and say, we're not going to auction this off to the highest bidder, we're going to just give it to municipalities to do with as they please. Yeah, that would be nice,
Wouldn't that be something? Anyway, yeah. that's another. <laughs> that's another. I think the disruption theory is the path, though, because you start, you solve a problem at this level, and then you work up, up the stack. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to solve it politically. We're not going to start up there and fix it and come back down. We're going to start. A lot of people are skeptical about the business model around 5G, and so a lot of people think it's going to implode. We'll see. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. I, don't, I don't know that. So, can I ask, getting back to fiber, I, yes. I think the thing is that um, one thing I don't understand the model of Anna um, is who, who keeps track of the packets and who pays for them? And is it part of the municipal um, ballot to have to do that? Or is that the virtualization such that you're just passing everything through? Or a dumb pipe. Yeah, I mean, the simple answer. So. Um, and I'll get into that a little more, but there's really three stakeholders. I mean, there's three players. There's the network operator, which could be the city or their agent. You know, a lot of cities are going to just outsource it, and they'll probably outsource it to an ISP, actually. I mean, they know how to operate networks. So there's the network operator, there's the service provider, and there's the customer. And so the network operator is responsible for running the network, what we do, we're a software layer that sits on top, and we just orchestrate and automate between those three stakeholders so that the network operator has what they need to operate the network, the service provider has what they need to come onto the network and interact with both the network operator and the customer, and the customer can get on and do what they want to do, which is find services and, and access them. Okay, so then other, other than municipal traffic on the network, then you don't have to worry about that as a cost or, or something that uh, the city government would have to maintain. No. I mean, so I'll, I'll go through the business model, but there is a third of the costs are going to maintenance of the network. A third of the total, and I'll, I'll walk through that. And that's, that's fine. I mean, yeah. But I think the, that's the one thing that, um, yeah, there's such confusion at, at a city or municipal level about you know, how the technology works. The last thing you want to do is yeah. be in charge of the money. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of cities will bring in a, a partner to do it. What we care about is local control over the infrastructure. And so they're going to have a five year contract, and if they don't perform well, then ultimately the city will set policy and decide yeah. how it gets used. The other, the other question is that, all right, so you have, you have a pipe that ultimately goes out of the city. Yeah. Um, and you're, it's usually just going to be a single provider, uh, like at and for example. Yeah. Um, are there mechanisms that the city can then say, well, you know, can we um, make that this larger pipe that we're fitting onto, uh, can we pay for packets, not from at and but from Sprint or, or somebody else? Is that an option that uh, the city has, or is it for just for the middle mile? Yeah. Yeah. There's multiple middle mile. Like Zao is one company. That they've gone around the country buying up assets, and they they don't do to the premise; they only do middle mile. Okay, I mean, yeah, the economic model is fine, but if it doesn't extend past right. the city limits, if you're an island, then it's a problem. You're screwed. Yeah, yeah. same problem exists. So to get you back to where I think yeah. I was the one to drag you off. Yeah, could you define what a wireless ISP is? So a wireless ISP. Is doing the same thing that a wired ISP is doing, but they do they do it with a signal instead of with a wire. So they are they're going to have equipment and then they're going to have a receiver and they're going to send the signal to your house. So rather than having a wire connect you to the internet, they're going to use wireless technologies to connect you to the internet. So they're doing the same same thing that a wire. Point to point. Yeah, I mean, there's different technologies, there's different ways to do it, and um, some will use do a microwave signal, and um, there's a big conference with all the WISPs every year, I think they call it Wispalooza, but they, there's a lot of them, they're, they're everywhere, but they just have a small customer base. We have a mountain. So, yeah, it's a problem. Know, it's nine miles, well, no, it's yeah. actually... Oh, you're saying to shoot We're nine from. miles from Springfield yeah. to Federal Street. And I've always thought we could bypass a lot of it. We just did it wirelessly. So, yeah. But most people have said, oh, you can't. 
because there's interference and it's this and that. Yeah. So when you start <coughs> wireless high speed, I got to. You can make, I mean, Greenfield's doing it. I don't, today. I don't know what they're doing. It seems like they've got fiber, and then they've got like well, they've got Wi-Fi fiber. repeaters. They do. And they're not going to get past Main Street. I mean, I, well, they're, so, also, they're having a bandwidth problem. I understand it only goes up to 100 megabits per second. Yeah. You know, I think it's probably shared bandwidth, but I don't yeah. know when that, so that. I'm not saying it's the model I would recommend. I think fiber to the premise is the right model for the long haul, for the long term. Um, they had a problem, they solved it that way. So, give us a little more about why it's more efficient to have fiber go all the way to the house as opposed to the fiber just going down the street. <coughs> Well, your cost isn't that much. I mean, there is a cost to get it to the home, but when you spread it across 20 years, so it really is a flow of money and a financing problem. Yeah. So the, you know, and Comcast wants, they want to finance their network over three to five years. They want a return on investment in that period of time. But cities can deal in longer periods of time. And when you do Within that, 10 years. 10 is fine. I mean, that's, you have local control of infrastructure, you get to decide whatever it is, but the longer the period, the lower the monthly, what people tend to care about is what's my monthly bill. And, and the so. Other, the other thing so is what we have now, you basically get up in like my neighborhood on Bear Hill, everybody shares the same coaxial cable, so. There's all it's the a shared network. network. Yeah, all which the time, is the major streaming Netflix, cable. and you get, you're sitting there, you got yeah. the, the week. Yeah. So you said $3,000 per house, is that over, over 30 years? I think 20, 20 years? Yeah. So what's that three thousand dollars for? Actually, I mean the thing is that um, Verizon comes in; they have a, a big deep uh, pole cutter. Strip, and they, they do it like in an hour. You know, yes, yeah. fiber, and that's it. Yeah. You also pay for the, the back fiber home. along the street where you live. Is that yeah, I mean that? again, what's different cities are going to do it different ways. Yeah. Some yeah. cities are not going to pay for the back phone. Most of Ammon's cost was to put the conduit in the ground. Mm -hmm. And there's electronics, so you've got electronics at both ends, you've got electronics at the house, electronics in the data room. Um, and then, but really the, the percentage of the cost is heavily on the construction side. If you're gonna do it aerial, telephone pole to telephone pole, you're going to, you're, it's gonna be lower. So unless you've got a fight to get on those telephones. Long term lower? Is that maintenance with storms? No, I'm just saying up front lower. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's other problems. So you also have to rent on the telephone pole. Yep, you have to rent. It's 12 bucks a month for four or something right. like but that. But digging is expensive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Digging is expensive. And That's why there's an advantage to having the road crews in charge of laying fiber while they dig. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why not? Yeah. One thing that uh, yeah, you advantage about wireless versus fiber, if you go to at your house, connect to your wireless and go to speed test off that, and then plug into the coax to your router, do the same thing, you'll see a huge difference. Uh, I think wireless is around, well, wireless G was 56K, I think newest ones are like 25, or 250K or something like that. But wireless AD is 10 gig, but that doesn't mean it actually works that no, well no, over no. any distance. Right. So on the end, the reason why I'm pressing on the numbers is yeah. that... Do you want me to jump to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's because what I wanted to know was what was the balance, it was voluntary to have... Optional, yeah. Um, to have it to your house. Yep. And is that number, did, what was the rate of acceptance? Was it 90% of the people accepted it? 99%? What was the 70% so far. So they're not done with the project, but they, this is their third year, and it's... The first year was 74%. The next year they did a lower income neighborhood where there's more people that just don't have, they don't connect, they just use their cell phones. Mm -hmm. It dropped down to 64, and but this year they're, they're back at 70% of opted in. We think, we think over 10 years they will get everybody that connects. Mm -hmm. And the cable company thinks that too. The cable company that's there told them and we have an 80% market share, and we know we'll lose them all to your network. We will lose everybody over time to your network. So some are in contracts, they couldn't come over, some, are, some don't connect, some aren't paying attention. Yeah, so that's the way the numbers flow. 
The monthly infrastructure expense is 17, so that's the $3,000 translated into a 20 year financing. The ongoing MO is 1650. Does that number include that call in the MO? So that, that comes under the services, so it's the ISPs that are providing. That's really what they're doing is giving you an IP address and giving you a backhaul. So that, that's covered in, in their expenses. A hundred so, symmetrical for 10 bucks a month, oh, plus the well, it's cost city, of course. Yeah. Wow. So the magic of this partially is people are committing to pay off that infrastructure. And that's, you know, that's important in our model that people are saying this is an improvement to my property. I'm gonna treat it that way. I own my connection, which means I can pay it off. So once they pay it off, your monthly cost is then at 26 And how long does that take? Is that 20 year pay? 20 years. Well, so under that financing. 20 years, you might. Some people just wrote a check and said, great, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but not everybody can do that. Right. So they're financing it. I mean, ultimately, people, what people do care about is the monthly cost. We, we did a pretty thorough survey in Ammon, and it was $90 under the cable company. That was the average. And so... More than that here. <laughs> it's going to be a lot higher than that here. Yeah, it? actually, Probably I did an informal 200. survey, and I'm happy to share it with people. I'm Great. writing it up like I'm finished yeah. for Comcast. Yeah, yeah. so we cut the price in half, and we tripled their speed. And we gave them a symmetrical speed. The amount seems to be at least a third off of the incumbent provider. And this looks like it gives you more of a So your model assumes that people can buy off their portion of, uh, they basically pay for their Minus 675. Yeah. And then the prices go down. Does that stay forever? Does that stay forever? Stays with the house. So if you move to the house next door, you may start over. Oh. But it does, it stays with the house. So do you know of any towns that have had any income <coughs> component into how they charge? That feels low, but I do believe you. I'm not sure on your question. Well, uh, that is said, uh, if, you're the digital under, divide. if you're under a certain annual income. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about that problem. Price. That's why I say cities are the only ones that are going to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. So under this model, let's say, so I own a fourplex right by the University of Utah. <coughs> and so I just tell the tenants, you're on your own. So they all pay, we have Google Fiber in Salt Lake, so they all pay Google Fiber the 50 whatever bucks. So for that complex, it's 200 bucks and everybody has their own deal. But in this model, you could bring fiber to the premise and you could so if the city's interested in solving the problem, they can do this through policy and say, if you're a landlord, you have more than a duplex, you're, you have to provide infrastructure and you have to provide the m and But we want you to solve the digital divide. So in that case, they, with my fourplex, I could split the top two lines among four tenants and then say, go get your ISP on your own, but then their cost is like 15 bucks, right? So, you, I mean, the best way to solve the digital divide is bring the cost down. So where even Google Fiber, which is a pretty good deal, 50 to 55 bucks, you could say, you can easily get down in the 10 to 15 range for that scenario. But the important part is you've got local control. So you can start to manage this. And, you know, if the city really wants to solve it, they could say, if you're under this level, you're not going to have to pay them and all. You're effectively spreading that across everybody that does, but you can start to make those kinds of policy decisions. So the only way to solve it, though, I think, is locally. So another question on the uh, so this is symmetric 100 100. That's that's great on the upload. That's not. I mean, that's pretty much current. I think Comcast sure. here offers 150, and then I. For another 20 bucks, you get another 100 megabits. So it's 250 megabits. There's only 10, 10 megabits up. And uh, they're really strict about that. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, though, I could see 10 years from now that uh, people have much more creative applications. Um, yeah. You know, other than bandwidth yeah, intensity. Yeah. So, you know, you, 10 years from now, you'll be able to sequence your own genome in your home yeah. and you know, send a terabyte on, right? Yeah. Okay. So, the thing is that um, probably two years from now. But yeah. <laughs> well, 
uh, you don't want to compute that. Um, but right. the thing is that uh, is this infrastructure such that you could pull more fiber? Yep, so there's gig. So the base is gig. Mm -hmm. But if somebody wants 10 gig or 40 gig, yeah, they'll, you, you're changing the SFPs. I mean, if everybody did it, you're going to have to do some stuff with your overall capacity. But yeah, I mean, it's they made the decision that gig symmetrical to the premise, non-shared, is sufficient for now. Mm -hmm. But they're fully prepared to, to jump up. So in Ammon, if I looked there, I could basically switch the SFPs and move up to 10 or 40. Yeah, so you're, I mean, you're gonna work with the city. So you guys, so you guys ran like um, OM5 fiber, that, like so fiber? Not, I mean, you're not gonna go to 40. They're prepared to go to 10. Okay. Yeah. They're prepared to go to 10. And a gig. There isn't 40. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're not doing 40. They're prepared to go to 10. No. There's, there's 10 gigs right now. We're, we're, we're starting to look at 25. That's where we're going to go. Mm -hmm. Because the data centers all use 25 gig. So the SFPs are very inexpensive. Yes. If you look at NGPON2, it was a way to say, OK, I have four different wavelengths that I could use. And that's the way everybody, the standards came out to do 10 gig. Then we said, OK, nobody's buying this because the the optics aren't used by anybody. So then we came up with fixed optics for the 10 gig, and that's called XGS pod. And that's what we have right now. So 10 gig is out there today. The next step's gonna be 25 gig to the house. Yeah. It's hard to imagine applications that are gonna take you beyond 10 gigs, but I, I agree they're gonna come. Just today, it's hard to imagine. You, in Ammon, if you want a full gig symmetrical, it's $25 instead of $9.99. So you're paying 15 bucks more for gig symmetrical. Oh, wow. This is not a shared network. We're all going to move to Ammon. <laughs> I mean, it would no, probably we're build be it cheaper here. for me yeah, to I live there, so. for me to move there than it is to live here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Until we build it here. That's not constructive. Yeah, all from the back. You don't have to. You can move to Charlemagne in a couple of years. You can have one gig symmetrical. So I moved um, <laughs> You know, we, we, because of our, our interests, we jumped ahead a little, but is there something that you wanted to cover between there and here? That we Let me just point out while we're on this okay. slide. So this model is important for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you know, there's some homes where you're going to have a parent running a business and and then family internet. In this model, you're not going to pay for the top of two lines twice. You can have multiple ISPs over the same wire simultaneously. So if you wanted to add a business line, you're going to pay an additional 10 bucks. Or if you wanted to have the family on 100 meg symmetrical and the business at a gig. So it, it, it's nice that way in terms of and, and, and it helps in an apartment situation too, where you can you can do something that's a little more creative and a little more control than Comcast is going to give you. Is there able to do that now? What's that? Have two different yes. pipes going to one house? It's not two different pipes. We're virtualizing the network. It's software virtualization. Same hardware. Right. Okay. Same hardware. But it's the same piece of glass coming out of your splitter. Yes. That's carrying it. So that I'm putting that, that is only exactly. carry one signal. Well, it's it's not two one gig services. It's it's two hundred meg symmetrical ah, services. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you said a gig and a hundred. Yeah, I mean you got a gig pipe total. Gig pipe total. They they can subscribe to that, but they, their total capacity is is confined to that. Is there um, fire to like colored colored uh, light? change the equation about how much information could be carried in these glass? Multiple wavelengths over the same... Well, there you go. That's yeah. what I meant. Is that... That's, that's the way we're doing our 10 gig. Yeah. So, it's set up as g a one gig service, and we're picking two different wavelengths, and we're going to put that over the same piece of glass, and we're going to be able to offer 10 gig on that same exact fiber. Go is that a house by just putting in a different blade? And is there a limit to that concept like no. go with a third wavelength go with a fourth, fourth, fourth wavelength i mean will the fiber uh there there okay there is a limit to that obviously because there's a limit to everything the limit is ridiculously high yeah but there is definitely a limit 
some. So without running more fiber to the home, you can continue to increase bandwidth as technology system, at the end increases. Our WDM system currently has 320 wavelengths. So it would be an incremental cost to the city <laughs> and or homeowner to have to buy something new for their home, a new device on their end, and a new well, device at the city end. I'm playing with four wavelengths. A new device going to the home end. And then new for equipment. The city end, all they do is just put in a different blade. Different port. Chassis. Uh -huh. right. And that blade does 10 gig, or the blade right next to it can do 1 gig. Right. The blade next to that could do 25 gig. Okay. In the future, yeah. So the key thing, though, I think is we want people to think about the network different. Today, people think about it around the service. We want people to think about it. Where we want to get to is network as a service. So that the key thing I'm paying for is my infrastructure. And honestly, once you create, I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides, but once you create the possibility of disrupting the ISP silo, where innovation is in play and competition is in play, that price is going to continue to come down. And you're going to, it's going to really become an app. I mean, it's going to get automated. And so, but the importance of the model is Comcast's reaction, if you do something, their reaction is either to try and stop you at the legislature, or second is to try and drop the price temporarily until they kill you and not work with them. And so, by commit, getting people to commit, to the infrastructure, it's really hard for that game to work. Because people are saying, I'm well, I believe in this enough, I'm gonna commit to the infrastructure. And effectively what you're doing is taking the 17 bucks off the table. And you're d diminishing the risk for the city. Yeah. Well, it's owning versus leasing, is it? That's exactly right. I'm missing an important point. You say network as a service. Mm -hmm. But your network is separate from the infrastructure? No, infrastructure is a service, same thing. That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Good. I'm not missing Good that. clarification. Yeah. Infrastructure is a service. Yes. Yeah, so that really becomes what you're going to pay for is utility and then whatever you want to subscribe to. Unbundling's going to happen more and more. If ESPN had a platform to do it all, they would leave their bundled packages today. That'll happen in time. It's not there yet, but they're, they are what's keeping the bundle together. But if they had, you know, Netflix is totally unbundled. I think we'll get there with the other content people want to consume. Maybe you're getting to this next, but how do you entice ISPs? Like how, how what's it, like, is there a minimum number of people that have to subscribe or does the market have to be a particular size for them to want to enroll as a provider? Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, these WISPs, it's a brand new market for them and it's software. We can, we can integrate them in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And so they think, you know, come into a city with 5,000 homes, this is a brand new market for them. The cost is almost nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's not a problem we worry about. And it hasn't, it's, and the ones we're working with say, take us wherever you go. Whatever city you're working in, we want to come. So, and there's wisps everywhere, so it's not it's not a problem we worry about. But the wisp is getting into your, your let's say, if you put all your electronics at City Hall. They have a get presence. a connection to City Hall. Yeah, they have a presence. And then they stop right there. Right. right. And after that, it's still up to the municipality yep. to bring the fiber out, put the electronics out, to talk yep. to every home. And the WISP is going to be there, plus your connection to, to Federal Street or whatever yep. else. And you're going to have multiple ISPs fighting at City Hall to see who's the provider right. that you choose. Yeah. But the, your video you're talking yeah. about, and I'm, I love the way you, the city had the ability on its website that you could go in and change your various services. Yep. In a moment. Yep. Yeah. It, I mean, there's the credit card piece that takes about 30 seconds, but the rest takes about another 30 seconds yeah. to switch. Mm -hmm. Which is really, if you're really going to have competition, you want to get to a point and click system. And that then, and it was saying how the price 
yep. quickly dropped. As yeah, over 10 months, as they started at 45 bucks, yeah. and over 10 months, it got down to 990. As the providers realized, oh, there's competition. There's competition, and there's not a lot of cost. I mean, that was part of. They didn't know. Yeah. They didn't know what their cost structure would look like. So, <clears throat> to be fair to them, they had to figure that out. But now that you've got relationships with these providers, and they've said, when you go to a new city, take us. Their pricing structure is going to change in the new city. It'll be what it is in Ammon, theoretically. Yeah, we were asking them. We're saying, this is where we are in Ammon. Are you going to come in there? And they said, yeah. They said, we're coming in at 10 bucks for 100 So months. for other cities, you know, Ammon was um, gracious enough to be the proving ground for yeah. that and bring the price down yeah. for all the, the cities who come next, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little confused again, sorry. Okay. You said that fiber to the house was the way to go, but not what you're talking about wisps coming in. So, uh, no, you're good. The question's good. So we're just saying they know how to be an ISP. That they're doing that. They're just doing it wirelessly. So now we are bringing them into a wired context, but their world doesn't change a lot. They don't have to manage that signal. They just have to do sort of the back office part of it. We're taking out a signal. Your city hall is a connection to the pipe. Right. right. So when I say city hall, wherever you put your equipment, that's even all that's your hall. town. Yeah. And let's just say you're putting it all in that's city hall. Wisp is going to come okay. into city hall. Yeah. And start offering service. This wisp could come in. There could be a fiber yeah. coming in what? from spring. Well, they're all in city hall. Well not, so they'll be there to fill them. Well, yeah. they. Well, they they do everything they would do in a context where they're providing the wireless service. They're just not having to put the hardware up that's wireless. Mm -hmm. They're just doing everything else. They're still an ISP without the wireless content. You know the wireless piece of it. If you follow what I'm saying, no. So we were talking about well, wireless WISPs, which is wireless internet service providers. So right. You just said without a wire. So yeah. I mean, there's no, no wire. With, without the wireless piece. So basically, they're just internet service providers. So, in in a con without without this conversation, and um, if they're providing service somewhere, so they'll put up their wireless devices, and then they'll be an ISP, and the, you'll come to them as a, as a customer, mm -hmm. and you'll pay them for your service. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. In this context, they don't have to put the wireless devices up because every home is already wired by the municipality. So what they do is they just do everything else they were doing. Short of the, the wireless devices, they, oh, they're not doing infrastructure. They're just an ISP. Then we're calling them a WISP, okay. but they're really okay. just an ISP. Okay. So they they were WISP, but they have converted. That's they right. do both. They in some communities where where both there is a municipal. Okay, I think I'm following. You. Yeah. yeah. So both did though. The other guys are used to being infrastructure guys with wires, and we basically made them just a software company. So the same thing to wireless. They're no longer infrastructure companies. They're just software companies providing that internet on ramp. Okay, Does that makes sense. We were yeah, using this, like so. the and their costs are lower because they're not putting up hardware, so they charge less theoretically. Yeah. We would hope. Have you seen this presentation before? Um, not in person, but I, you know, it's I online. saw the online version. So this is the portal. And this is, I mean, the this is the portal two years ago. It looks different than this. Um, so this is just a little one minute video on what it's like. So the two of these are wired, one is a fiber comes a wisp. So you're gonna come in and we've actually automated some of these screens so you don't even see them anymore. So you're just gonna go click subscribe once you choose your plan and then it it takes <laughs> twenty seconds to get provision. You're provisioning a connection to that ISP is what you're provisioning. And so that's just done. And then you're done. So you go out, you go up to your dashboard, I'm subscribed, go out to go on our website in this case. Okay, not gonna lie, that is mind blowingly cool. <laughs> so. so basically your now you can IT subscribe. has changed, I guess, because you have a different service for that, so. Yeah, so if I don't like a new pricing package or I'm frustrated with service, I unsubscribe. <laughs> and you're not getting your email anymore from your ISP because if you flipped it like that, you're right. going to lose it. You have to have Gmail yeah. or Yahoo <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And so the virtualization here then, you're making the connection so that the new service provider 
is paying the backhaul on their That's pipe their and cost structure. Off? Yeah. I mean, to get to your point earlier, which is very interesting, like, well, what's going to distinguish them now? Like, why would you even bother switching? They're all just going to be the same. But I think, in, in my guess is that this is going to force these guys, so let's say there's four providers or ten providers that you can choose from, it's going to force them to innovate, to distinguish themselves. So, you know, we're charging nine ninety nine just like the other guys, but we're throwing in Netflix. Or something or that people want. Well, dedicated IPs, what would you charge? Yeah, well, so we're like, get to IPv6, ooh. and that's going to become more so possible. It's competition and it's innovation, which is exactly what well, you, know, you would hope for. To figure it out. Yeah. IPv6. Ugh, can't wait. So, if if you said, "What's your vision in one slide?" I would say it's this: that incumbent operators serve subscribers and us. So they've got an algorithm. And if the algorithm works, they'll serve an area, but they they don't serve every area. And it's because they've got this algorithm that says we're not gonna, it doesn't pencil out here. Cities will look at it different and they'll align with the subscriber and they're gonna do just the opposite. They're gonna do something that profits enough to provide the maximum service because that makes the community more livable. That makes the city more compelling. And so, the mindset is different, and it's really that alignment that's critical. That's why cities are important because of the alignment with the subscriber. Cities are also important. We believe they're the only ones that will keep these systems open. We think everybody else can be bought out. But cities have a different set of incentives, and some cities may be able to be bought out, but one of their important roles is they'll keep the systems open. Because they, they care about critical infrastructure. So I guess to me, one of the key things I'm learning, internet service providers, to me, right now means I get internet service through this area. Comcast will also sell me cable TV over here. I guess what I'm seeing is you can kind of munch them together. It was what you're saying, this new ISP model that the internet service provider may throw in Netflix or ESPN, or yeah. and that all becomes one thing where they bundle basic internet service with other content, possibly proprietary content, but they would have, yeah. they would offer. Yeah. To me, that's so different that's, than what that, we have now. So that's competition and innovation working. People are starting to get creative on how do I, how do I attract the customer? And we don't know where that's going to go. And part of the problem here is the city's got a contract with, for cable TV. Just yeah. for the franchise, but that's not going to stop people from going over the top to Yeah, YouTube I understand. TV. They, can stream, yeah. they can stream stuff online. Yeah. But and I guess in theory, if the city were to offer like ESPN or something, that would not be allowed because Comcast has got the cable TV franchise to, franchise to provide ESPN. Yeah, but YouTube yeah. TV has 40 yeah. channels and it's 40 bucks a month and they over the top. ESPN, yeah. And they got ESPN. And Direct TV, I think they're raising their prices, but I mean, you got Hulu, you've got more and more options to access content that looks just like a cable package. And, but it costs a lot less. Okay. Maintenance. Yes. You know, the city owns other infrastructure, mm -hmm. water and sewer and roads and whatnot, yep. and we have to maintain them. Yep. There's a cost. Yep. So what should we assume we have to budget in for long-term maintenance costs? So that's that 1650, that middle line. That's M and O, and that becomes a utility. Yeah. And that's the ongoing. So when I say network as a service or infrastructure as a service, that's that middle line, like 1650. I mean, some cities it'll be 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll vary. So then are you seeing or do you have opinions about is it better to contract that out or is it better to, for the city to hire their own people and get them trained or hire people who can do it and have them as employees? Yeah, I think, I think that depends. I, I, um, it, it depends on a few variables. We like it when cities own the whole problem and just tackle it because they can. It's not. This is. And we hire people. This is not them. electrical engineering. I mean, it does involve electrical engineering, but it's these are. It's an IT problem and it's a public works problem. Yeah. And they can develop. They can learn how to splice fiber. Uh -huh. They can. I don't know. That would be a real hard push for our DPW, and they're pretty good. Yeah. I, Fixing poles. Well, they're just they're making it so much easier now. I mean, there, there's just so many 
Splicing fiber today is different than it was five years ago. We're just getting better and better tools well, to make it easier for people. If someone well, can I'd do like it. to convince them to do it, but I don't know. If well, someone what? can do it, you can yeah. hire someone yeah, we'll who can do it. You can get a contractor. Yeah. Contract yeah. it out, because you're never going to have the trucks. So let's say a hurricane came through right. North Hampton, the a big snowstorm that takes down a bunch of poles. We had the if you only got one truck, it's going <laughs> to take forever to get everybody back up. That's true. So you're going to have to get a contractor. Somehow have a relationship with a contractor to come up yeah. and help you guys yeah, out, a problem. or have the ISP build that into theirs because they have the trucks. You yeah, know? like the Hoyle Gas and Electric who has trucks, the Westfields, you know those folks. Municipal light plant. Yeah. I think that's a good point because those trucks are very expensive. Yeah. They take a lot of training. I was SMET. I was outside playing. Plus the, the manpower that has to be on call. I mean, you know, a lot of times they'll be sitting around doing nothing, so you're going to be paying, paying them a decent wage with a pension, and they're, they're playing cards, because I mean, there's nothing, nothing to fix. But, you know, unless you could somehow develop a regional company that, that was That's actually a good owned idea. by the, you know, well, collection of communities, that, that would work. Back North when Hampton, East Hampton, I talked to Holyoke, they said they would be interested in talking about contracting to do idea. that sort of thing, to do wires maintenance. What happened to that? Uh, my board wasn't interested in going forward. I don't think you'd have trouble finding people. I believe Westfield Gas and Electric might be interested as well. I mean, I know how to splice. Yes, they'll, they'll maintain it. If we build it, they'll, they'll maintain it. Of course, they'll be an ISP, too. They'll be a little bottle of wax if you want. You can use them however you want to use them, but the beauty of it is you get the municipality gets to make the decisions about how, how they want to do it. Well, yeah. probably just what do you want to hire them for? This piece, that piece, all of it? You decide. Yeah. Change name? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I noticed that Leverett changed uh, their provider to get the people out there running the trucks around. So they just, I guess they have a couple year contract with them. If they don't like the service, they just hire someone else. One, one way to do it would, that I think would be brilliant is um, if you've got two or three companies in the area that are willing, contract all three of them. That way, if you're, uh, you know, if you have a real big problem, call them all in. And some might might respond faster, some might respond slower. Some might have a problem in their own town they had to deal with. Right? Yeah, so it gives you some options. It's like hedging your bets. It's like having two internet providers in case one goes down, your other pipe is still up. Mm -hmm. Same concept, but I get it. I don't. You know, it's like when uh, fire you know, fire department, the original fire department, so like twenty of them running around New York or something, right? So you know, you you had to keep paying you know these individual fire departments, but then. Then it became common for towns to have their own fire department, right? Yeah. But this, to them, I mean, to, this, to, to convince people, this is the same thing. You know, needs a good um, presentation. There's a lot of convincing. Yeah. Well, yeah. The internet is, you know, this infrastructure is just as important as your sewer, as your water, oh, as your fire department, and your police department. That's correct. You can't so it's call about half a million dollars a year so. for uh, rather than closing the maintenance. Is that yeah, I mean, 1650, so times that by your population, so it should scale. These are, this is software-defined network, so you want to do as much of the network management and software as you can. You shouldn't have to do truck rolls. You should know, do I have to do a truck roll? Um, the other thing know. is, are they in Hammond, do they use poles, or do they? Do they, they bury them. And they have significant hardware maintenance on that, or just is it mostly just software issues? I, well, most of the issues that people have are actually inside the house, just not in, That's the main issue they get called out on. Okay. Um, and so, action. your company, which builds the software, yeah. Where does your um, where does do where do you paid? fit in here? Yeah. How do you get paid? So we charge. We anchored it to Amazon model. We're charging ten percent of that middle line, so we're charging a buck sixty-five. For subscribers per month, so we're not making a living. You know, if we only had Ammon as a customer, we're not making a living. We're we start to do well once we get to volume. So we're a software company. How do communities get around the telephone pole problem? I mean, in Ammon, Ammon, were you able to just dig and bury it because there wasn't much there in the ground? But like in our town. You know, I talked to our DPW about it, and it's yeah. like you know, going down Main Street. So he looked, he looked into digging, and the only place you could dig is the center of the of the road, because yeah. there's a, there's all the stuff in there. And the gas company won't reveal where their stuff is. They claim Homeland 
security. You know, you have to actually be digging the hole, then they might tell you whether it's okay. But they won't give you a plan. Yeah. So, and then he says, well, the police, he says, you know, most of his projects, the police cost the most because you have two guys out, they're getting paid extra money, it's hazard that's, pay because they're standing on the road. Especially true in Massachusetts. It's not like that in other parts of the country. Well, I mean, so the tele and the telephone pole problem is just huge. Yeah. You gotta rent the poles, you gotta do this pole study, which is, you know, hugely expensive. Oh God, the pole Twice, study. actually. You huh? have to do it once for your electric company and once for your phone company. You have to do it twice. In Massachusetts, not in other states. For each pole, if you're putting fiber up, mm -hmm. you have to do what twice? Once for the phone company and to once to the, 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 the no, you have to do it for both. I think even if you even if they don't own the pole but they're resident on it, we have to do it on both. And you can't do it at the same time, which no, I think just reinforces the value of local control of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if cities own their poles, this wouldn't be a problem. But yeah, it's a local control of infrastructure. Okay. They missed that boat a long time ago. And that's yeah, we did. Well, towns like Westfield and Holyoke didn't miss that boat. Exactly. Because they're the gas and electric company, they and they own the poles, so this problem was easier for them yeah. to manage. Northampton's an example of a town where the city does not own the poles, so it'll be we'll have the same problem you do. So what's their solution for the telephone pole problem? No. Oh, no. Just develop a relationship. You know, Verizon owns a lot of poles in the northeast. So yeah. I think they own the poles. In, I think they own all the poles in my town. Yeah, that's the majority in Northampton. Not all, but well, it's about twelve lot. bucks per pole per month. You just gotta build it. Yep. The, the the the, the good news. The only good news. I think they that. I, you know, four bucks per pole. No, twelve. No. That's around twelve bucks. I hear the twelve. I hear the twelve yeah. dollar number. Per 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 pole. Per pole. It's not like a lot of money. It is. It is a lot of money. What kind of contract? I mean, what did they guarantee that price for a certain period of time, or can they go off? I think that's true. Uh -huh. yeah. The good news is that the, the business model you're disrupting here is Comcast, not Verizon. That's that that's relevant. Charter. Doesn't matter. Charter doesn't own the polls. Verizon does. I know. That cool. that's that's a, a, a that's a factor in your favor, our favor too. Yes, that they'll absolutely. Verizon stands to gain yeah. rent. Yeah, though they I talked to some of the linemen, they said they were very happy to put up the yeah. cable. Yeah, they stand to gain rent, and you're not disrupting their model right. as much. Mm -hmm. As Comcast model, you are disrupting it because of people who are still have phone service. They could now get the phone, but that was already disrupted by and then, Comcast. And then there's the attachment prior. fee to the pole, and then there's if the pole needs upgraded because it's not tall enough, and the lines right. are too close right. together. And they can make money on all those. And things. that's what our mayor is proposing to study with this study, which he wants to start no sooner than July, I guess, is when fiscal year starts. Right. So that's to quantify how much. What's the scope of the cost yeah. that actually do? So, so there's just no, this, this sort of is bothersome because uh, with the exception of the main streets, the, the city owns the strip between the street and right up to the other side of the sidewalk. Or yeah. the, and um, when I lived in Princeton, New Jersey, that's where Verizon, uh, well Princeton, had, everything is buried there first of all. Yeah. But, the burial was not in the streets. It was along the sidewalk. Yeah, strip. And, you know, they basically, the only thing that's there is Tree Northampton as far as, uh, uh, you know, use of that land as far as. So, with that, I mean, had they considered looking at just minimizing the number of poles, keeping it to the main line? And I can't believe that they can't do something even on the main streets. But why would they want to get into that morass? Well, I think you're kind of jumping the gun here. The point of the study is to look at all these spots and figure out a way to do it. Oh, okay. You said it was maybe a like the bike path. Maybe like, maybe they got the they could just do something on the bike path. Mm. We we yeah. like buried if it's feasible. A lot of the northeast has a lot of ledge and rock and other problems. But if it's feasible, long from a long term solution, we like buried. It's far cheaper probably over long term. Total life. I, I know. I yeah, know when yeah. they did lever. You know. Something you don't even think about, but tree roots. Yeah. You know, there's mm. a lot of trees on the side of the road where if you're trying to take a path down it, you're going to wreck every tree. You know people with their trees. We like them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, except in a tornado, they become weapons or the following yeah. storm. So how are we doing on time? Do you, do you want me to talk about virtualization? I mean, we've covered the main areas. Probably because we have to something later than nine. Something we've got most of our questions yeah. answered. Well, 
But if you have more you'd like to tell us, I'd like to hear I'm it. I'm happy to tell you about virtualization if you want to hear it. I would like to hear about how, yes. you, how you guys do virtualization. Okay. I, I would just, before you get going in that, just as a, um, a courtesy to the people who yes. came, um, we're very grateful that everybody who came to hear um, what, um, what's being presented here. And, uh, you know, I don't know that we placed an end time on this necessarily. So respecting people's time, if people need to get yeah, home, uh, I would say don't feel shy if you have to kind of walk out. But there are some people clearly who are interested in hearing everything. And I think it's sort of a, a very gracious of Jeff to be giving his time and we're going to try to use as much of it as we can get a hold of yeah. so yeah, that's great so that, that's all I'm working until 6 o'clock in the morning <laughs> yeah, well, like, I mean, like I said if you gotta go you gotta go so yeah. so anyway in terms of our value proposition we talk about two things one disrupting the ISP silo and it's not because we have it out for the ISPs it's just we have it out for the silo which means if it's open we think the whole thing should be open and a lot of good things will come so we talk about exposing the ISP to dynamic competition, which will drop the price, which makes it you know, switch in 60 seconds, and then expose them to innovation, which we think, you know, these folks have been really protected from innovation for 15, 20 years, because they have these silos. So we think some interesting things will happen when we do that, and then it's possible to solve the digital divide. So the other value proposition is disrupting what I call access to the layer two silo. So the internet happens, and I don't want to go too technical. Um, the internet happens at layer three. So this is one way to think about the network. There's one way to think about it. So the internet happens at layer three at the network layer. And this isn't the way, I'm not trying to describe how this actually works. I'm trying to just sort of help people think about you can also communicate a layer two. Mm -hmm. and, and so you don't, so don't take this lit drawing too literally. Okay. But one problem, one potential problem, and it would be a potential problem for you, is what happens in a scenario where you get cut off from backhaul back to Boston? And I don't know where your routes go. I don't know if you're going to Albany. Or... We can go to Albany, Boston, and New York from here. Yeah, so what happens if you get cut off? Probably not likely because you got three routes. But what happens if the internet is your only means of communication? You're out, right? Redundancy, hopefully. Yeah, and hopefully redundancy solves the problem, and it most likely will. But if you have this other capability to communicate at layer two, which, so the internet we, we communicate from IP address to IP address, and the layer two, I think about it from MAC address to MAC address. So then you can build applications so we could build an application that would allow the city to send out mass communication on layer two. People are used to communicating on layer through the internet, but you know somebody said something about moving a large file. Or layer two, yeah, you, you could you could very it was the genome. We oh, solve yeah. our genome problem. If you wanted to send the family genome out to the children, then you, you need an application that makes that to sort of onboard it and send it, but. That we're really interested in what's going to happen in open access of layer two. We think the the network effects of this are nobody's really thinking about it. If you want to get one of these private circuits today, you're going to pay a thousand bucks, twelve hundred bucks per circuit, or more. <laughs> um, and so when you make it inherent in the system and make it really inexpensive for people to use this. We're really interested to see what happens. And the one famous thing they did in AMA, they did a, they won this Department of Justice Award, was they, they did a layer two network, put gunshot sensors in the school, connected that to video cameras, connected the, all that to the PSAP. And they were interested to find out how fast can we get eyes on an event. So the sheriff came in, fired shots into bells of hay, they wanted to know how fast will the gunshot sensors pick it up, relay it to the cameras, relay it to the PSAP, and then can we relay it to first responders on their devices? And they were able to do all that in about 20 seconds. So, and it's just one example. Did you mention this to the mayor and Marco? This is the kind of stuff that we engage in. Yeah. 
Yeah. He's talking to me about the city, I guess there's city apps that can be like, where's my snowplow and how long? Yeah. Oh, that would be great. I have a question. So I, um, th this is very intriguing. The layer two concept is intriguing for IT people. So I know that you're probably very engaged in, in that concept. Tell me again how many seconds um, you said that was? About 20. 20. But I, uh, I, I'm a little worried about security, right? Because you can also have security problems mm -hmm. at layer two. Um, is it part of your software solution to um, kind of build out some security out there? So we, so there is, we, we, the University of Utah built all our prototypes. So that means we built the prototypes that we've commercialized what they did. And one of the things they built is that if an edge device attaches to replace our gateway, so they unplug our gateway and attach their new gateway, there's a handshake that happens. It says, are you authorized to be on the network? Mm -hmm. And so if they can't do that handshake, then that device gets quarantined and, and the network operator gets notified. So you have to talk about security at different places. The, the service providers are responsible for their whatever, for securing their mm -hmm. service. And how about if, um, if they're a legitimate customer, mm -hmm. but they're malicious? Yeah. So they, they, they can get through the handshake. They haven't replaced your hardware, mm -hmm. but now they're on the network and they can, you know, yeah. again, is, is there an aspect of your product that is doing some security or is that uh, up to the municipality to kind of bring in a vendor to... Yeah, so we, we actually have just hired a guy that, so they're in Idaho, close to Anna, about 10 miles, there's the Idaho National Lab. So we've just hired one of their PhDs to come in and go through our whole system and say, tell us where there are any gaps from a security, this is a security person. Mm -hmm. Tell us where there are any vulnerabilities in the system so that we know where we have to be thinking. So the one that we've solved for is the idea of somebody coming in and sort of getting in front of our gateway. Um, that's what we've done so far. And then we say, if you're a service provider, you gotta secure, whether it's encryption or however you're gonna do it, you gotta secure your service. <coughs> and I actually just got an email from this guy today who's gonna start his analysis on what other holes are there that we should be worried about. Great. I'm glad you're paying attention. Yeah. I think privacy and security are, are going, they're a big deal now, but they're going to become a huge deal. I mean, it's really, and that's part of the value, I think, of this kind of system is that an open system, you can, you know, we can start to pull in that community the same way the internet has attracted solutions from the world. Open systems do that. Great. Right. And, and so are those um, requirements written into the policy that each city could track the of what's malicious behavior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I know in Utah, we just passed law, I think it got through the legislature, that service providers cannot do anything with data without notifying the customer. That doesn't mean the customer is necessarily paying attention, but they cannot give the data, they can't use it in any way without notifying the customer of what they're doing with that data. And I think that's gonna become increasingly the case where we're gonna, we're gonna get, if we wanna pay attention, we're gonna get transparency mm -hmm. on what's happening with our data. So you said layer two is $1,200 at this point, but how do you lower the price to use layer two? So it's... What's the, what's the mechanism? So it's, it's not $1,200. So let's, let's imagine that you've got a network everywhere. Everybody in the city is connected. Mm -hmm. And so we've built in to the platform the ability for people to, from, from the beginning, our goal has been to make layer two as easy to use as the internet. That, that was all, that's always been our, our test of success, is make layer two as easy as layer three for people to interact with. So it's all about automation and software control. And we're not there yet, actually. We've got it working in the lab environment. We will f deploy our first layer two applications in AMA. And we've done this test bed with a gunshot, but we won't deploy those until third quarter. They gotta, 
the same people at the University of Utah got a National Science Foundation grant to work with Ammon on public safety applications. One of which is the ability to dynamically control the traffic, which means I think of it as pushing traffic off to the side of the road as the ambulance comes through. So to give priority dynamically on the fly to public safety traffic. So that's part of the research they're doing. We won't deploy that until third quarter of this year. So some of this is hand waving at what's coming because it's the, the full automation is not there. My own belief is it's cool that we can change the ISPs and we can bring competition, but the really interesting stuff to us as a company is what's going to happen in layer two as we automate it, as we make this new thing possible. Mm -hmm. And we're not the only ones working on it. I mean, I think a lot of 5G is looking in the same direction. So do you envision that some people might want to buy the ability to use it themselves, Yes. but the city would be able to contact everyone in an emergency? Yeah. Yeah, so... Kind of like everybody, like this, like the city can push out a call. cell phone message to everybody, a text message right. saying, you know, seek shelter, a hurricane's coming, or whatever they might push out to your cell phone. I guess it would be analogous to that. Wouldn't work the same way, but it'd be analogous. <laughs> We've declared a snow, a snow emergency. There's a lot of, I mean, I've got a short list. We are working with a number of utilities who are primarily interested in Layer 2. They're, they're interested in the ISP stuff, but their primary interest is what can they do with their grid management and monitoring with Layer 2 networks. What's SCADA? SCADA, that's your, like your water system. So SCADA is an acronym for managing city. Tell me what the words are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I looked them up here. Go on down. Wikipedia. What'd you say? Supervisory control and data acquisition. Thank so you. So for automated, uh, so the water treatment plant, for that, example, that, uses that, That's good. Thank you. Like you. I just made the words. I, I went to a training once where he said, we don't want you to use acronyms, and that's why you have to learn 8,000 new acronyms so you all use the same that's ones. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good question. So that would be robots, too. Yeah, so that system... It can be human to human, it can be human to machine, it can be machine to machine, machine to human. So it can be any of those things. So if you, it's the whole IoT world, it's you know whatever. We, so I think about layer two as anything that requires more privacy, more security, more reliability. And for us, I think it'll end up being layer two and a half, the technologies we're using. What's the difference between two and two and a half? Some people say MPLS is two and a half. Some people say it's two. Um, I think so. We're using the next generation of MPLS, which is segment routing. So anyway, that's that. So the last thing I'll show you is, um, so in disruption theory, disruption is taking something complex and making it simple, something that's expensive and making it inexpensive something that's inaccessible and making it accessible. We think open systems allow for this evolution to happen at a much faster pace than a closed system. And so that's really what we're interested in enabling is that evolution, because things get cheaper and more valuable things get built. Well, that's how the internet, that's how the internet became successful. Right. But by putting in stove pipes, so yeah. it changed. Yeah. Okay, question? Can you retrofit your virtualization technology on top of, like, you've got And the fiber's the fiber, yeah. right? So it's really what are your electronics and then what software's involved. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, I know the Nokia guys are really, they love Pawn. Mm -hmm. um, what we've done so far is active Ethernet. Mm -hmm. um, we will, I think in time, we'll be agnostic to it. Um, some people... Our founder is very, it's religion for him to be active Ethernet. I think Pond's getting pretty sophisticated, and so some of the problems with Pond. It's just a big cost difference. Yeah. Active E costs so much more than Pond. I think that's, yeah, I think the total cost of ownership, I mean, we get in debates on this all the time. I mean, some people are really strong on Pond. We think total cost of ownership is not that different, but I know that Pond guys feel that way. 
we've modeled it out and if you believe in that could be you need a fiber from point A to point B from every step. Well, we aggregate into, we, I mean, you use a splitter out in the field, we aggregate into a switch and then come back to the main. And so our, our guy, I'm, I don't have a dog in this fight. We want to be, ag I want to be agnostic. Our well, guy we, who, we do aggregate. Yeah. So I don't care. Yeah, our guy. You want to buy Active B? I'll tell you that because it costs more. <laughs> yeah, I think there are there are people who are substantial people who think the total cost of ownership is very similar. But <clears throat> I'm not an expert in it. I'll just I can tell you what we're doing today. Um, pawn <coughs> is a shared concept, so you're splitting and sharing usually between 32 okay. premises. <laughs> Tell me the words again. P -O passive passive optical, optical network. network. Thank you. Versus active. Passive versus active. Um, so I think Pond is getting to the point where the shared <coughs> thing is not as much of a problem as it's been historically, where you know you don't want to do certain things on a shared network because there's a reliability issue. So if connected vehicles, so autonomous vehicles are gonna be safe on their own. But if, if you had the idea of connecting a vehicle and that the network was gonna provide the safety, you would you want that network to be really reliable. So that's a sort of an extreme example. If you're gonna do a robotic surgery from Boston to Northampton, you want that network to be really reliable. And I would say 10 years ago, that pond would be a problem, but I think pond's gotten sophisticated enough that that may not be a problem. In terms of the shared nature and the reliability. Okay, anything, any, it's for your time. Just, um, Thank you. Just to restate that, restate the last thing a little bit, so I understand it better. Yeah. I did have to Google it while that was going on. Um, so Active-V for fiber is closer to what I'm used to with copper versus pawn as if, as if we were doing everything by kind of just splitting the wires something like that, and adding different... So the way I think them. about it, I'd say he's probably more of an expert than I am. The way I think about it is you're going to have active electronics out in the field or you're going to have passive electronics out in the field. Passive, you're going to have fewer heat issues. You are, you know, how would you answer that question in terms of... Well, they're both active. Your, your own tea on your side of your house is an active piece of equipment. It's mainly that Bond's going to take that one gig signal bring it to a 1 by 32 splitter and 32 people are going to share that one gig if you do a 1 by 32 split. Westfield does a 1 by 16 split. Active E, Hoyle has Active E to all their customers. Okay. That's a direct pipe that we're going to give you one gig and we're going to guarantee you mm -hmm. get that. So your, your neighbor is not going to affect what happens. Right. So another question in our model is when you spread the cost over 20 years, what's the impact of a GPON network versus a uh, versus an active network? Oh, yeah. It ends up being a couple of bucks. Oh. I mean, even if you take their numbers, just compare them side by side, you spread that cost over 20 years, a couple of bucks a month. So, so which, would, which would you install if it were your... We are installing active today. Um, we have a goal. We've been, at, we've been talking to Nokia some. Um, we have a goal to be agnostic so that if our clients care one way, but if it's just left to us to make the decision, we're probably going to do an active network. Because? Um, because it's not a shared network. <laughs> because it's not a shared network. Well, the ISP could make it shared on their end, the virtualization, but it is inherently not shared. It's, it's I mean, it's like having a, it's having a wire between you, and the data center, and you. You don't have to worry about disruptions because of what your neighbors are doing. Unless, I mean, no. depends I mean, on the back haul of your ISP. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah. I mean, I mean Lever might out, tell you gigabits in your house. What are you going to get? But you're gonna get if a one everyone had signal, it, they only have one gig. Maybe a 10 gig signal? You ain't getting one gig to every house, right. anyways. So it's just a matter yeah. of right. how, or at what point the bottom Right, the contract is out there. And, you know, to take 16 residents, well, chances of 16 people simultaneously hitting the button saying, I want to download what this passive name? video. 
Me? Yeah. Well, I'm Ryan. at 6 p.m. when people all get if home from work and hop on the computer, 6 p.m. Ryan had to have a, yeah. an issue like that. I mean, I think, that's right. I think that's 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 we don't all know what the, what's really going on. That happens on my network. I'm on a CenturyLink shared network. And... And I do notice when my neighbors yeah. are doing stuff. It's a big difference, right? But it's because I don't really know what's going on inside that network. Sorry. But you also don't have a one gig that you share. With That's, true. <laughs> That's true. That's <laughs> true. Makes a big difference. That's We're true. giving a one gig pipe, and there is an application out there right. currently today. It's very good to take over 40 meg. You know, yeah. Even if you're downloading that video, so to share that 40 meg, even if 60 <laughs> people do jump on it at the same time, and it can affect that gig signal. Yeah, you can advertise if you have one gig speed. You know, that brings up an interesting yes. point. Did your numbers cover media and marketing? Uh, media and marketing, sort yeah. of the educational campaign yeah. in the community. Yeah, so we, um, in Ammon, the total cost to the homeowner covers the whole project. Legal fees, bonding, you know, everything was rolled into that. Um, and those so, are the numbers we looked at? Yeah, yeah. those are the numbers we looked at. But that is, I would say, if you're going to pick one thing, I don't think this is a technology problem. I mean, technology is important. It's a business model problem. It's a political will problem. And it's an educate the community problem. That success really is in educating the community, getting the leadership around it, and what kind of business model do you set up. And whether it's pawn or active, you can build a good network. It, but what we're really interested in is, you know, I read an article on Medium the other day. We don't need more technology. We need better business models. And I think that's really true. That's extremely accurate. Something yeah. business model. Yeah. So. Are you going to be staying in the area, uh, coming back to the area anytime soon? I, I would like one of our select many weeks to come. Yeah, I'll be back the week of April 24th. Well, we hear... So I have cards. I'll just give you my cards. Yeah, so I'm, I'm doing enough. They might come to your town. They might have to come here. <laughs> I have to be able to bring them enough people. That's his, that's his business. Yeah. He's a salesman. One He'll is come enough. to your town. He will? Very, a very good I salesman. Do that. There's cards. All right. Please. So, Jess, thank you very much for, for time. spending the time You're with us very and gracious. helping us out you to you know, think this <laughs> through and learn. I just want to take a picture. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate yeah. your interest. Thanks for all the feedback and thanks to Northampton Community TV for today. Uh,